to oh we're back we're live it's uh, 12 o'clock rock here on a given monday this is think tech of course you knew that and more than that this is marco and me we're talking about energy here on a monday marco joins us um, from uh, hilo from provision solar in hilo hi marco welcome back to the united states i tell you jay what a way to start a manic monday but listen listening to the calm soothing voice and demeanor of one jay fidel i just <laughs> pushed me in an almost rapturous state but not quite <laughs> well you know we have to follow our energy you know it's like these national issues tend to uh, you know take the 20 top stories in the new york times and the new york times opinions and the new york times uh you know what do they say things you need to know um and and, and local news, you know, falls by the wayside. And there was, in fact, an article in Civil Beat this morning by Brett Obergaard, who is one of our contributors, uh, to remind us that, yes, there is local news, and we can't, you know, be completely distracted with uh, the Trump news, which is, which is distracting us. So I'm happy to talk to you, Marco. No more happy than I am to hear your soothing voice, my dear friend. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, let's talk about solar because solar, you know, has been the, the big drama, and solar has been the, the the big promise. It's the center of the promise. It's what we think of when we think of moving to 100% uh, by 2045 or 2040, if you like. Um, but solar seems to be in trouble, and that's what I want to talk to you about now. It's in trouble nationally, and worse, it's in trouble locally. What's the trouble? Well, maybe start on the more macro level first. Uh, the implementation, adoption, installation of solar electric uh, modules, photovoltaic modules, has been growing very steadily each and every year. I, I, I remember back in the early 2000s when the cumulative production of photovoltaic modules uh, for the world, for the world, it was one gigawatt, one gigawatt. And last year, I believe somewhere around 70-ish gigawatts went in. So that just shows that we've gone from a teeny tiny uh, amount of PV going into a hell of a lot more than a teeny tiny amount. Although when you look at the total energy consumption of uh, on a planetary basis in terms of uh, generating electricity, that uh, renewable energy is still a small percentage and still very much outweighed by, by fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, coal, and to a lesser extent nuclear. So on a global scale, uh, PV has continued to grow, grow, grow. But uh, on, and as well on the national scale in terms of what's going on in the U.S. mainland, but you know, the, the contrast could not be more dramatic in terms of the rhetoric, in terms of the pontificating about how Hawaii is so well placed, so well positioned to be able to get these rather ambitious uh, renewable energy targets. You know, first it was 2045 and now it's 2040. And now it, it's, it's kind of a ludicrous exercise to some extent in my opinion, uh, talking about things 20 years more from now or more from now uh, compared to doing or what's happening on the ground right now. The, the contrast between the the highfalutin goals and aspirations of decades from now versus what's going on in our state right now. And the reality is, is that the PV going in, or at least being permitted in 2016, was uh, the lowest amount uh, across the, the islands uh, than in the past six or seven years. And there are a number of reasons behind that. But I mean, to say a business owner uh, who lives and breathes this and has been doing so for going on 17 years now, uh, as I've said to you before, I'm much more concerned about the next 6 to 24, 36 months than I am about what happens 20 or more years from now. And the numbers are down, and I, I just got some recent data as well for January, January 2017. And uh, for Oahu, which of course is the biggest market in the state, the uh, Department of uh, Permitting and Planning there issued the fewest number of PV permits January of last year uh, in all the past six or seven years since uh, my crew and I have been crunching that data. And I also learned as well just over the weekend that the Big Island also issued the fewest number of PV permits since we've been crunching data uh, since the beginning of 2013. So again, the, the contrast is so dramatic about what, uh, what people are talking about in terms of hitting these ambitious renewable energy goals and more and more and more solar, and yet uh, the reality on the ground is moving, unfortunately, in kind of the opposite direction. 
Yeah, well, you know, but let me ask you, is this going to, is this immediate effect of this going to affect our ability to do 100% by 2045? Or is it just a blip, you know? It's like this kind of a, a climate change uh, approach by some people. Oh, it's just a blip, right? Or, or will it have a profound effect on our, our goals and reaching them by 2045? Well, I'm sure you've heard of this kind of metaphor known as the cone of uncertainty, which is not kind of, not not quite the same as the cone of silence, uh, you know, as far as get smart goes. But the cone of uncertainty is uh, once you start predicting things farther out into the future, that cone gets larger and larger and larger, right? Yeah. So as far as whether this is a blip or not, I mean, uh, I'm just really, really uncomfortable in projecting decades out of it because I think our prognostic prognostication powers and wisdom as a species is just notoriously poor when it comes to to that kind of those kind of predictions well i think I, but let me add this though that uh, i don't think we have a plan where you can say well this is where it's going to be in 2020 2025 2030 and so forth <clears throat> we don't have a plan if we had a plan uh then we could at least have an aspirational uh, in an aspirational track, a uh, trajectory of where we're, where we're going. But without a plan, I agree with you that predicting is very nigh impossible. Um, so I guess uh, if we had a plan and then we did reality tests on each one of the steps in the plan, uh, we'd be in a better spot. Still wouldn't be certain. Big cone of uncertainty for the lengthy period involved. But, uh, you know, we, we'd be spotting more issues. We'd be spotting more risks. We'd be factoring in more, you know, more, uh, more of the realities, and we could make um, a better prognostication. <clears throat> what do you think? I mean, uh, uh, is 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 this going to drive government and the uh, you, you know energy industry to make a plan? Well, if you want to talk about plans, I mean, let's look at the most recent power supply improvement plans that were submitted by the Hawaiian Electric Companies to the Public Utilities Commission December 23rd of last year. And their plan or prognostication, whatever, whatever noun you want to use here, for the near term, which is they're, they're describing as 2017, which we're in now, to 2021. So that's the next five years, right? Their plan in terms of... Uh, but to, to be clear, to be clear, Marco, right now that is only a proposed plan. That is not an approved plan. That's not being implemented or executed. It is merely uh, what they wish to be the plan, right? You, you, no, you're absolutely right. And the power supply improvement plans for the PSIPs are under consideration right now with the various uh, interveners on the docket firing questions at Hawaiian Electric. And uh, uh, the, the, the commission, I believe, has a fairly aggressive schedule in terms of kind of bringing the evidentiary stuff to a close in the relatively near term, so again, near terms, and then move forward in terms of to what extent the PSIPs uh, pass muster this time with the commission. But to, to illustrate my, my point here, I mean, that their prognostications for uh, distributed generation, which I, I, I translate into rooftop solar, in other words, small-scale solar, is very ambitious for Oahu. They're projecting in the next five years alone another 255 megawatts, 255 megawatts worth of DG, of rooftop solar. And this is for an island that has, if I'm not mistaken, about a peak demand of around 1,200 megawatts. Uh, for the Big Island, they're projecting another 30 megawatts worth of rooftop solar. And we have probably somewhere, ooh, maybe 80 or 90 megawatts, pushing 100 megawatts, uh, uh, either in a pipeline or actually installed now. So that's a substantial increase. Well, I, what I hear you saying is um, uh, this may be wishful thinking and not, not likely of success. Uh, I mean, do you feel these things can be achieved? And does the plan provide for ways in which they can be achieved? Well, uh, in terms of how they can be achieved, I, I, I have to take, you know, dig deeper into the 2,000 some odd pages of the PSIPs. But I mean, this was their best effort, uh, uh, which I give them a lot of credit for in terms of the latest iteration of their PSIPs, which uh, is actually, when you count them, uh, going back to the first one, which was the, uh, the last uh, IRP, Integrated Resource Planning, then you had PSIP 1, PSIP 2, PSIP 3. This is PSIP 3, which is actually, uh, in a sense, kind of power supply improvement plan number four. And, and, and not a single one has been agreed on. 
Not a single one has been actually in place, approved, the and implemented. The previous ones have been found to be, shall we say, inadequate, and Hawaiian Electric has been commanded, ordered to do better, essentially. So, you know, it remains to be seen uh, in terms of how the jury is going to decide the the last piece step, which, like I said a few moments ago, is under consideration by the the, the interveners and, and the paid consultants that the, the PUC has hired, and then ultimately it'll be the commission itself that'll decide, the three commissioners, as to whether it passes muster as well. But again, you know, my, my, my main point here, Jay, is that I just see this kind of glaring, shocking disconnect between the rhetoric of megawatts and megawatts more of, uh, of DG rooftop solar, and yet to the reality on the ground that myself, uh, my company, and my colleagues, my competitors are experiencing is, uh, is nothing short, to use a Trumpian adjective, of, of solar carnage in, in the making. And you know, I'm sure I have somewhat of a, uh, of a rap or reputation of being a solar Cassandra, and I can't tell you how much I would appreciate someone coming and challenging the data or challenging my interpretation. I would love that. I really would. Well, I let, let me ask you this. Uh, just suppose, okay, this plan was approved. I mean, I'm not particularly optimistic after all the years and years and all the efforts and opinions and meetings and, oh, yeah, yeah, um, you know, that we have had without a plan. But let's assume it's approved and let's assume that we are ambitious and we want a sort of a 25% increase in the next five years across the board. Um, and by that time, you know, it's likely that a lot of people in the solar installation industry will be out of that business uh, and that we will not have the juggernaut we had a couple, three years ago of solar installers who can put solar on a roof and while you watch, uh, we, we won't have anybody with the, um, you know, who is in business or with the, um, you know, the skill and the resources to, to do solar. And my question to you is, assuming that be the case, and it's happening, you know, it's devolving right now, that industry, as you know, is devolving right now. Assuming that we get to a plan which says, let's go for 25% next five years, how will we achieve that without an industry? Um, we, we need to take draconian steps to rebuild an industry that has been mortally wounded. Yeah? There, is that, uh, there is that concern. I mean, uh, I don't keep track of uh, you know, job losses in my industry. Others do, um, but I mean, I've heard figures in the thousand or more. I mean, again, compared to the, uh, the, the banner year of 2012-2013, uh, you know, we're, we're a small, uh, uh, much smaller fraction thereof. So my concern is, I think what you're saying is, 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 is shared, which is, you know, if we shrink to a certain much smaller uh, a shadow of ourselves, then when things do pick up again and batteries are cheaper and the integration of battery storage on both sides of the meter becomes more commonplace and, and less scary and more cost effective, uh, who's going to be around, who's going to be left standing to be able to do what needs to be done? That's a great cliffhanger. And on that note, we're going to take a short break, Marco, and we'll come back in a minute and we'll talk about the solution to all of that. And there are solutions. Be optimistic. You'll see. We're going to take a short break now. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. We're Think Tech, and we're um, Marco and me on Monday talking about energy. And we're talking about the, uh, the health of the solar industry and the intersection between that uh, and, and uh, an incipient plan, a, a putative plan, if you will, uh, to have a dramatic increase in rooftop solar over the next five years. Um, and so the, the question I put to you is, uh, you know, what, what happens if, if the solar industry, the solar installation industry is, is wounded in, in the, you know, 
right now it is already wounded. And, and one answer I want to throw at you as a possibility, Marco, is that, you know, we can do this if we really attend to it. In other words, if we say, we're going to do this, we're going to have 25% increase across the board, um, and we will do what it takes. And what does it take? Well, it takes a, a tax credit. Go back to that. Um, it takes um, incentives of one kind or another. Uh, it takes um, financing arrangements, and I don't mean gems, because that's not, in my view, not a viable financing arrangement uh, to, to get this done, um, and whatever else. And if we focus on it, then the industry will come back, don't you think? Well, let me address that this way. I mean, it really boils down to what the adoption, what is the rate of, of adoption amongst those remaining um, customers, utility customers who don't have PV, who will still want to have PV, right? I mean, we have the highest PV adoption rate per household here in, in Hawaii. Up till now, up till now. By far, by far. So what is actually kind of the natural cap to, to adopting PV? And let's, let's work at it this way. Roughly 30% of people who live in the state are renters, renters. Mm -hmm. And if you are living in a rental home, you are not likely to, you're not gonna pay for the PV system yourself, of course. And what incentive does the owner have to pay for a PV system when you, the, the, the tenant, is paying the bill, paying the electric bill? So you can immediately kind of almost eliminate 30% of, of people who live in the state because they're renters. Now you can say, oh, community solar, community solar, community solar, which is kind of the, the almost the mantra that we're hearing from certain segments of the, of the energy stakeholders. So that's going to be the next big thing. Well, I mean, I'm certainly not against community solar per se, but uh, I mean, it's just going to continue to be a work in progress in terms of nailing down the details of how it's going to be adopted, implemented, how it's all going to work. And you want to take gems as an example, you get the state involved in stuff like this. In this case, GEMS is a financing mechanism, right? Has that been successful? And where can you find the state really having exemplified coming up with a program and making it work where everybody is applauding rapturously? No, and you wouldn't, certainly don't want the state to get in business because the state can never do business as well as business can do business. And where did I see recently an article about GEMS, about how how they you know really minimal amount of uh, loans they made were to insiders oh that right. just makes it much worse so i mean you wouldn't use gems and you wouldn't have the state get in business you you try to incentivize business you try to incentivize the people who would you know do installer companies um and and that means that to me that's the challenge we can make all the goals we want it's all aspirational until we figure out how to get people to do those things and we haven't done that yet now is the time for us to be thinking about that. That should be an inherent part of any plan. Uh, how are we going to get it done? And that means the legislature has to act. Uh, and it well, has to find creative ways to act. From what I understand, there are bills now in both the House and the Senate that would allow for, make for, I should say, a specific uh, state tax credit for energy storage. Now, last year, uh, similar bills were going through the legislature, and uh, they reached the conference committee in early May. And uh, as you know, conference committees are supposed to hammer out differences between different versions of bills, right? And there was, uh, shall we say, um, uh, somewhat of a discord between the chair, the Senate uh, Energy and, and Transportation Committee, uh, Lorena Noe, and the chair of the House Environment, uh, uh, Energy and Environment Committee, Chris Lee. And all the bills, if I'm not mistaken, the energy-related bills uh, died. So we can hope, of course, that there's going to be a different outcome if, in fact, energy storage bills make it through to a conference committee. So in the best-case scenario is energy bills make it to a conference. It goes to the governor, governor's desk. The governor signs it into law sometime in June, early July. Uh, the, the best possible uh, outcome would be that it goes into effect July 1st, because that's happened before where a tax credit bill goes into effect practically within days of, of being signed into law by the governor, or, you know, more realistically, it goes into effect January 1. So what is going to be the net effect of a tax credit specifically provided for energy storage? Of course, it's going to be a benefit. Is it going to be a game changer that's going to cr create a dramatic uptick in the adoption of battery-based 
customer self-supply systems, I don't think anybody would make that case. I sure as hell would not. You know, but you know, but looking at it on the flip side, uh, yeah, it's not going to be disruptive. But if we don't do it, I think we'll have disruption on the downside uh, because it will not. This this project will not get off the ground unless we provide some kind of incentive. And for the lack of incentives on batteries, when they're going to have batteries, and without batteries, um, I think we've taken all the low-hanging fruit. It's not going to grow at 25% in five years. Um, so I'm a little worried, and I hope the, the chairs get together and make a deal here and push that legislation through. It's, it's not only the tax credit for the, the batteries, it's also, it's iconic, it's a statement, it's a symbol that we care about this, that we want this to happen, that it's a priority, that energy is a priority, that solar is a priority. We've got to make that clear. Well, it's just too bad that Tamina couldn't join us today because uh, I don't want to speak for her too much, but my recollection is that she is uh, probably would not be necessarily in favor of a new tax credit for energy storage. And uh, that means there are people out there, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for Mina, uh, that uh, believe that the energy industry or renewable energy industry in the state has already been very heavily subsidized, and, and a strong case can be made for that. If you look at the past three years, 2016, 2015, 2014, the total figure in terms of uh, the amount, uh, the total dollar amount claimed by tax filers in the state of Hawaii for the state renewable energy tax credit is probably somewhere around $500 billion. Uh, I'm sorry, strike that. Wrong, wrong B. $500 million, so half a billion dollars that did not go into the state general fund from tax credits for renewable energy. Now, of course, the, the counter argument to that is that there are a number of, of um, other benefits that accrued very tangibly by having all this solar going in and by employing people and so forth. So I'm aware that, there, that this is, you know, it's not just black and white. You can say $500 million did not go in the general fund. Oh, all well, the wonderful things we could have done with that money. So it, it, it's, uh, it is worthy of discussion. But, I mean, you know the state situation in terms of finances, Jay. I mean, we've got schools that you have kids who are still sweltering despite the government. Oh, you should see the teachers out in front of the Capitol today. There must be a thousand of them in red shirts protesting. Um, it's, it's, it's The schools are a big issue. But let me, let me offer this last thought before we go to our last point, and that is um, if we want to achieve these goals, we can't do wishful thinking. It's not, it's not going to come down from heaven and make it happen. It's not going to happen by some divine process. We actually have to make it happen ourselves. We have to find incentives to change the way, to, to encourage people to take the action necessary to reach the goals. If we don't do that, it's a goal, the goal that's silly. And uh, so I, I leave you with that thought. However we do it, we got to actually do it. But let's go to the last point. And that is um, the, the article in yesterday's uh, Star Advertiser um, about uh, thermal solar and about the exemptions. Can you talk for a minute about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, Katie Mickle says the uh, piece kind of just whacked me between the eyes. I made the front page of the Star Advertiser where there was a law that was passed in uh, 2011, I think, a handful of years ago, that uh, essentially mandated for all new housing, uh, single-family residences, I believe, that they would have to install a solar water heating system. And yet they left them an out. They left the, the builders an out that they could apply for an exemption. And I think they applied to DBED. It's kind of bizarre they would apply to DBED, but, you know, what do I know about DBED? Well, arguably, that's uh, where the energy office is. Yeah, probably the energy office. So uh, her, her main point was that you had close to 5,000 uh, applications for exemption. In other words, the, the builder, the contractor, the developer saying, uh, I don't want to do this. It's going to add too much money to the house. going to make it too difficult to sell or any other type of uh, rationale they used. And the exemptions were granted uh, the vast majority of the time. So to me, I just left, you know, leave my head scratching in terms of what, what good is the law if you have this carve out and you're allowing developers to get an easy out? I mean, solar thermal, Jay, is such a, a no-brainer. Yeah, such a I no agree. Brainer. It was when always us. Yeah. A so, median house cost on Oahu of more than 700000 the cost of a solar thermal system is, is, you know, shave ice kind of scope in terms of cost. I mean, it's just, 
what are we doing? You know, well, well, I, I, I think the developers are shaving off a couple of thousand dollars for the solar thermal system. They're 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 trying to avoid the the cost of it. It's as simple as that. And that, that the house is that much cheaper. But it is not a good idea. It is not in accordance with state policy. And what are the tests for the exemption? What do you have to get? What do you have to do to get an exemption here? Uh, I guess fill out a form and say you're going to put in a flash heater, also known as a tankless uh, water heater, uh, and it's not going to be electric and it's not going to and put an additional load on Hawaiian Electric. I, I don't know. I've never actually seen the form, but clearly whoever is processing these applications, the, uh, the fallback position is to stamp, uh, stamp it apparently yes approved. So uh, maybe Katie's piece will get the, more of a spotlight on uh, on the process of granting exemptions, and if that, if that happens, and once again, you know, the so-called fourth estate of our friends in uh, in, in journalism, uh, you know, they're earning their keep as far as I'm concerned. Yes, but you know what's interesting to, to go back to the point uh, of who handles this. It's the energy office, presumably in uh, DBED, that is giving away all these exemptions. That office, formerly under Mark Glick, uh, now they're looking for a new leader. Uh, that that office um, uh, is dedicated to uh, reaching our energy, our clean energy goals. I do yeah. not completely understand from the story why they would give exemptions in this number. Um, it, it doesn't seem to me to give any appropriate to give any exemptions, or maybe a few for special circumstances. But this is a huge number, and what it means is whoever is giving the exemptions doesn't care too much about clean energy. Sorry to say. Yeah. Well, Marco, wonderful to talk to you as always. I look forward to every discussion with you, and I look forward today to a discussion two weeks from hence when I know there'll be other things come up that we will have a, a lovely time talking about exploring, philosophizing, romanticizing, and predicting, don't you think? Once again, Jay Fidel and Think Tech Hawaii rocks the known world. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. Thank you. Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar in Hilo.